to be with you. It's good to be here. Good evening. So good to see you. Oh, you are looking at me a bit strange. Oh, yeah, this is why. Um, let me just show you what's going on. One second. Sorry. Don't. It's a bit rude, isn't it? I'll just explain what's happening to my life right now. Can you hear that? Okay. And your call will be answered by the... Let's start that again. <laughs> All of our representatives are currently busy. Please stay on the line, and your call will be answered by the next available representative. The estimated hold time is currently less than 96 minutes. You are currently caller number 32, waiting to speak with a representative. Thank you for your patience. So I was just on hold, and I, I didn't quite make it through, so... Um Maybe we'll, we'll come back to that later. Um, but don't you just hate being on hold? Isn't that one of the most annoying things that, that we can face? Um, I recently moved house, and actually I called our utility provider um, four different times and was on hold for an hour each time <laughs> before I managed to get through to someone. And it really got me thinking about being on hold and just how frustrating it is. And we're right in the middle of our All In series, and we're coming to the end of our section on prayer, um, and we're looking at perseverance. And so what I want to look at this evening is what we do when life puts us on hold. What do we do when there's things that put us on hold? What are those pause moments that appear in our life? What do we do? And that's what we're going to look at this evening. And there's many things in our life that can put us on hold. Um, we could be waiting in a lift to go up a few floors. We could be sat in a really long traffic jam. We could be on the phone like I was to my utility provider for a very long time. They don't provide my utilities anymore. Um, we could be queuing at a till. Um, we could be waiting for our university test results um, or our A-level results. Or we could be waiting for a friend to come out of an operation. Or, or waiting for that new job that we've wanted for a really long time. Um, or we could be waiting until our next payday because money's a bit tight. Uh, or maybe we need inspiration for the next essay that we're writing and there's nothing coming to our mind. And all of those things are daily things that put us on hold. They're those pause moments in life that put us on hold while we wait for something. And some of those are a little bigger than others. And of course, there are some much bigger things that put us on hold in our life. Like when we or someone that we know is diagnosed with a big illness. Or someone that we know dies. Or perhaps it's a stage of life thing. There's some students in the room and some young people. Maybe you're waiting for the next stage of life, the next big thing to happen. Uh, or maybe it's about our dreams and desires. There's so many things that are in us that we want to achieve and move on to. And maybe it's just not happening yet and we feel like we're on hold. We're paused in that moment. Or maybe, as we're talking about Alpha, it's the salvation of those that we love, our friends and our family. Maybe we're on hold waiting for people to come to know Jesus. Or maybe it's breakthrough from an addiction or a stronghold in your life. Whatever your pause on hold moment is, we all have them. We face them every day. And some are much bigger than others, but I believe that everyone in this room will have an on hold moment. And as I was um, on hold to my utility provider for an hour at four separate times, I'm not bitter about it. Um, there was something that I realized. I realized that I didn't actually have to wait around and do literally nothing while I was on the phone for an hour. Um, it's something about, uh, particularly my generation, I think, that we believe that we're a multitasking generation, and we often get told we need to wait. And that's true. We do need to be a lot more patient in life, um, and sometimes we do need to slow down. But when I was thinking in this instance, I was like, I don't need to. There's things that I can do. Uh, and it got me thinking about patience and perseverance, because the Bible tells us that we need to wait patiently. It certainly does. In Romans 8, it says this. Um, it says, For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Now, I don't, I don't disagree with that at all, because it's in the Bible. <laughs> um, but what I want to do this evening as, as we kick off is just pose the question and maybe challenge our understanding of what it means to be patient. Um, because actually the English word patient um, is used in quite a passive way. It means to accept or to tolerate something. But if we look at the Greek word that is used in this passage, it's actually hupomon, um, which means to remain or to continue or to abide or to act in accordance. They're all active words. They're not passive. And, and often it can mean also to keep to or to hold on. So when life puts us on hold, 
We aren't to be passive or to wait or to sit on our hands. We're called into action. When life puts us on hold, we need to hold on. That's what I want to say to us this evening, that when, when those on hold moments come to us, we need to hold on. But well, what exactly do we need to hold on to? Well, Jesus' life was all about holding on. He came to earth as a baby to fulfill a mission. And there was 33 years that passed before that mission was fully completed. So he spent his life being on hold, but he didn't waste a moment of it. He went about doing his mission and ministry and doing great things in that whole time. He didn't waste any of it. And there's a process that goes in that, in that time. God could have saved us in an, in an instant, but instead he sent a baby. And it took 33 years for him to grow up and fulfill his final mission on the cross. So Jesus was a bit of an expert of knowing what to hold on to in moments when he was on hold. And so what we're going to do is look at one of um, his greatest moments of being on hold. In the Garden of Geth uh, Gethsemane, he knew what was coming, um, and he was waiting on an on hold moment and prayed this before he was about to be crucified. So in Mark chapter 14, it says this. I'm going to start a little earlier than the passage on the screen. It says, They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sor sorrow to the point of death. He said to them, Keep here and stay watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if if possible, this hour might pass from him. I remember thinking about myself when I was on hold for an hour. And then he said this. He prayed this really significant prayer. He said, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. I'm just going to read that last bit again. Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. So from that passage, four things we're going to take that Jesus held on to. And the first thing is hold on to God. Jesus said, Abba, Father. We need to acknowledge him and that he cares for us. God loves you. He's interested in you. He's got a plan for your life. And not only that, but the Bible tells us that he's jealous for us. He's jealous for time with us, to hear from us, to connect with us. Too many times I think I hear people say, oh, I'm really struggling with this, but there's, there's so much going on in the world, I couldn't possibly bring that to God. God's not interested in such a small thing. Well, he's so interested. He's so interested in whatever our on-hold moment is. In 1 John 5, it says this. Um, this is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears. So I want to encourage you that he hears you. He hears you when you pray, so it's worth it. Often when I uh, sit on hold, particularly when I'm sitting on hold for an hour to a utility provider, I actually wonder whether the phone line's broken. <laughs> and, and I genuinely, I did this when I was trying to get through to them, I called them on another phone number just to check that, that I was not like in some kind of endless cycle of waiting because it was so long. Um, and I wonder if sometimes we think that's true when we're praying to God, that we wonder if it's getting through, if he's hearing us. Well, when it comes to God, I want you to know that the phone line's not broken. He hears you. He hears you. So we need to acknowledge him and that he cares and that he listens. And we need to invite him in. We need to actually pray about these things. Actually pray about our on-hold moments. It's easy to say, oh, he knows, um, or I don't have enough energy to pray, and to just kind of discount it and keep on going through our lives without even realizing that we're not praying about these things. And I say this from experience of myself, um, but I see it in the lives of so many people when I chat to them. In particular, I was chatting with a friend of mine not too long ago who was having a really, really difficult time. His life was absolutely on hold. He was questioning so many things. And I remember just saying to him, just quite flippantly, just going, oh, so what's God saying about it then? And he just goes, oh, I don't know. And, and it's, it's amazing because he, he's a, a spirit-filled person that's pers like pursuing the things of the kingdom. But when he was on hold, when his life was in chaos around him, 
he just immediately became paralyzed and forgot a really simple principle of bringing it to God, praying to God, acknowledging him, bringing it to him first. And so he needed to be reminded to do that. And of course, as soon as he, as he took that step and began to pray, things shifted and things changed and he saw a breakthrough. But we need to remind ourselves to actually pray. It's so easy to get caught up in a motion of just praying for others and forgetting about our own on-hold moments. We, I think we can often tell ourselves, oh, the selfless thing to do is to pray for others around me. And absolutely, we want to do that. We want to pray for people around us, but not at the expense of praying for the things that are in our lives. We need to do that as well. So acknowledge him. So hold on to Abba Father. It's the first thing to hold on to. The second thing that Jesus held on to was truth. He held on to truth. He said, everything is possible for you. We're in a war. We're in a spiritual war. And when we pray, we're doing battle. We're in a war between earth and flesh and the heavenlies and his kingdom. And when we pray for things, when we're on those on-hold moments and we bring them in prayer, then we're in battle. So we need to hold on to things. Hold on to the truth. We need to put on the armor of God when we go into battle. Ephesians 6 talks about the armor of God and it says, Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So the, the sword of the Spirit is the battle. This book is our, is our sword for the fight that we've been placed in. And it's full of truth. It's packed full of truth. So many verses that, that can speak into and over, actually more over, all of our situations and our circumstances. It's packed full of miracles, power to heal the sick, to give sight to the blind, power of raising the dead to life. Luke 18 says, what is possible with man is possible with God. Mark 9, it says, everything is possible for one who believes. Matthew 17 says, say to the mountain, move from here, and it will move. There is power that we read about and we know is true in this book, in this word, the truth that we need to speak over our situations and when we're on hold. We, we need to remind ourselves of that belief that we can see amazing things happen, that anything is possible for God. Because in those moments, it's so difficult. It, when you're in an on hold moment, there's a world, the reality around you that shows you that things are difficult, that you don't have this, you don't have the other, or you're stuck, or you're not moving, or you're not able to do something. Just like that whole music playing in your ear, you can't do this, you won't do it. Jesus knew what was coming against him, but he, and, but he knew that the kingdom reality overcomes our worldly reality every time. He said, everything is possible for you. He knew the right thing to declare in that moment. And I, I wonder if, if rather, than, rather than having this playing in our ear. All of our representatives are currently busy. Please stay on the line and your call will be answered by the next available representative. The estimated hold time is currently less than 96 minutes. You are currently I wonder if rather, rather than being told your call on number 36... There's 90 minutes. You're not good enough. You can't do this. You're never going to be healed. You're never going to pass that test. What if this was the whole music being played in our ears? That was the truth that was playing over us in our ears while we were on hold in those moments. The truth that we have access to heaven today. That you can crawl into his lap right now. That he works all things together for the good of those who love him. That he is your healer. That he is your provider. Jesus knew that everything was possible for God. Of course he did. He was Jesus. He, he was God. But he still chose to declare it. 
He still chose to say it and to, pr- and to pray it and to proclaim it. And that's what we need to do. We need to de- procl- proclaim these things over us. And, and that will look different for each of us, but there's a few, a few ways that might be helpful to do that. So in, in my journal, there's, there's something that, that I've been going through for, for quite some time. And so for me, the journey of my identity has been a real struggle. And so I, that's, that's an on-hold thing for me, of, of walking in my identity. And so in here, I've got declarations from the Word of God that say who I am. You are called of God to Timothy. I am blessed, Galatians 3. I am set free, John 8. I am strong in the Lord, Ephesians 6. I am accepted in him, Ephesians 1. I am a masterpiece, Ephesians 2. And, and I just read them and I declare them and I speak the truth of God over my life and over the on-hold moments when I'm feeling on-hold and I'm like, who, who am I? I go back to my declarations, the word of God that I've written about myself and I declare them over myself. I, I know that they're true and I could sit and they could just sit there and I'd be like, oh yeah, I, I can remember some of them. But there's power in reading them and declaring them and going over them. And then, and then Bible, and they, well, they are Bible truths too, but Bible truths in the actual word of God are so, so powerful, important. I, I often go through, and um, it's really helpful if you, if you can have a, a concordance in the back of your Bible and you can look up a word that's important to you. So a while ago, I was really struggling to see hope in any situation. So I just found hope in the back of my Bible, and I went to every single scripture that talked about hope, and I just read it and underlined it. And when I'm struggling, I just go back and I just declare the truth of hope, the hope of Jesus, over my on-hold moment. And, and last little h- helpful tip that uh, might be good for some of you is w- worship music. I, f- I find that really powerful. Um, but I'm intentional about it. So I, I'm starting to compile um, specific playlists for specific on-hold moments. So I've got a playlist that's packed full of songs about freedom. And when I'm struggling to understand my freedom, stick it on. Song after song after song, declaring and singing the truth of God over that situation. Same for hope. All that kind of stuff. And the same is true for God's promises over our prophetic words. I know that loads of us in here will have prophetic words or things that have been spoken over us um, that we believe that we're going to see happen in the future, and, and we forget them. So we need to write them down, and we need to go back to them, and we need to declare them over our situation again. I, um, I had some, some words spoken over me as I moved to Cheltenham, which was about two and a half years ago now. Um, it was a really difficult thing to do because I was invested in a, in a church family in Lincoln. I'd been there for five years on the staff team, and it was a really difficult move. And so when I moved here and, and things were difficult, it became really hard. But what I do is I remind myself of the prophetic words that people have spoken over me. And in particular, one of them was that God will restore by double everything that I left behind in Lincoln. So when things are hard and things are a struggle, I go, no, God said he's going to restore by double. That was a prophetic word over my life. So the screensaver on my laptop is actually, I will restore by double. So when I'm sitting at my desk and life's hard work, it just pops up and I go, yes. You said that you would restore by double, so I will keep going until I see it happen. Declare the truth. Last thing I just want to say about truth is that um, this process is, it's, I think it's often more about the journey than it is about the destination. I think God's so much more interested in our journey of going through this and declaring the truth than actually he is sometimes about, about the provision. Um, and So we, we declare these, these truths, not... Of course, yes, because it shifts things in the heavenlies and we believe that that makes things come to pass. But because it does things in our heart and in our soul at the same time, um, so it's a double-edged thing. We're like proclaiming things for the future, but God's doing stuff in us at the time as well. And and I often think God sometimes does so much more in the journey of it than in the actual deliverance of leaving the on-hold moment. Um, Lastly, just quickly on that one, just to encourage you that God, God does speak to us. Um, I was having a conversation with someone the other day and I was really reminded that sometimes we can fumble about life and think this walk, this Christian journey is really mysterious and it's really difficult and God only unfolds certain things to us. And, y- and yes, that is true, but I-, I think we give the enemy too much power there in saying that sometimes we can't hear God and, and what he's saying. Um, my experience is that if we give time and ask God a direct question and sit and wait for a direct answer, he often gives it to us. 
Um, it might not be the answer we're looking for, or it might just be you need to keep waiting and you need to keep trusting, but it's a direct answer and we can hear him speak if we give him the time to do so. So hold on to God, hold on to truth. The next thing that Jesus did, he held on to honesty. He said, take this cup from me. Being on hold and waiting for things means pain and it means grief. It's hard. Don't ignore it. Jesus didn't. And we shouldn't. Jesus acknowledged it. He said, this is difficult. Bring me out of my despair. He understood uh, that he actually needed to go through with it, but it didn't stop him saying, this is really difficult. And if you can, will you take it from me? He understands that some, Jesus understands that some things are really, really difficult. And even though it's God's best plan, that doesn't mean that we can't be honest with him and say, this is, this is really hard. It's a real struggle. And, and the Psalms are an amazing place to go when things feel like that. They're full of honest prayers that acknowledge our situation. Um, I'm actually just going to um, read a bit of Psalm 55. There was another moment when, when I was absolutely in that moment of going, this is so difficult. I have no idea how to comprehend anything that's going on in my life right now. And, um, and a friend of mine threw a psalm devotional book at me and just went, just, just read today's psalm. We had no idea what it was. Um, and I began to read it. And um, it says this in Psalm 55. Listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. My thoughts trouble me, and I am distraught at the voice of the enemy, at the stares of the wicked. For they bring down suffering upon me and revel me in their anger. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death assail me. Fears, are trem fears and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. I said, oh, that I have the wings of a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. I would flee far away and stay in the desert. I would hurry to my place of shelter. And that, that passage spoke to me so powerfully. I was actually in tears as I was reading it. Um, my friend actually laughed at me because before I... Um, opened it, I went, oh, there's not going to be anything good in here, because I was feeling so sorry for myself. Um, and then I opened it and read that, and I was like, wow. I don't think I'd ever read a passage that was so on the point of just pouring out your pain to God. And in particular, when, when David says, oh, that I would, I would just flee if I could. I would just go away from this. I don't want to be in this anymore. We've got to be able to take that real pain of tension of the on-hold moments to God. Interestingly, the Psalms, this Psalm in particular, but lots of them, this Psalm starts with holding on to God, and then it goes on to holding on to honesty. And later in the Psalm, if you read it um, in your own time, it goes on to holding on to truth and declares the truth of God. And it also talks about my fourth hold on, but I'm not going to ruin the surprise for you. Um, but be, be real with God is my encouragement. Be honest, be real. He can take it. Um, he's the creator of the universe. He knows what you're going through. He can take your anger, he can take your hurt, your upset and your disappointment. <coughs> One of the, the phrases that we use in this, sorry, phrases, uh, verses that we use so much in this church because we believe it so dearly is his power made perfect in our weakness. And if we're really going to see his power made perfect in our weakness, then we need to be weak with him and before him. And he needs to see where we're at. And also be honest with your desires. It's not just about the struggles. Be honest about what you actually want God to do. What do you want him to see? It's not a selfish thing to say to God, this is what I'd quite like it to look like. This is what I'd like you to do. Jesus knew that God wouldn't actually take the cup away from him. But he said, I'd quite like you to, if you could. We need to be honest about what we're looking for in our outcomes of things. Because we worship a father that gives us good gifts. He wants to give us good gifts, so, so be real about it. Matthew 7 says, If then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask? So be real with him about what, what you want it to look like. 
doesn't mean that you're going to get it, but at least you've been honest, and then he'll, he'll honor that and work within you and, and probably speak to you about why it's not going to look that way. So hold on to God, hold on to truth, and hold on to honesty. Finally, hold on to his will. Jesus goes on to say, yet yeah, not what I will, but what, but what you will. For sure, being stuck on hold requires a kind of surrender to waiting, but there's a richer surrender to God in the bigger stuff. Isaiah 55 is a well-known passage that says, For your thoughts are not my thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And trust me, it's so difficult. I, I've been there more times than I care to count in terms of saying, God, you know better than me. But actually, I wish that this wasn't the plan. I wish this wasn't the way. But reminding ourselves that God's plan is so much better than anything we could ever dream up, dream up ourselves. And so surrendering to him and saying, God, your will, what you want. And that's not in contradiction to what I've just said, because you can, you can say, yeah, this is what I'd like it to look like because this is all I can see and this is all I can dream up and envisage at the moment. But I know that actually if you've got a better will, a greater will, then that's what I want. I want your will. We, um, we recently bought our, the house that we've just moved into and it was a real journey of um, not knowing what was going to happen and whether we were going to get the house or not get the house. And we felt like at the start that God had said to, um, to buy it, but it was crazy because we were getting married and it was Everything just felt like a, a really silly thing to do, but, but God told us to, so we, we went through with it. But then there must have been about four or five times where the housing developer rung us up and said, if you don't do X, Y, or Z in terms of solicitor paperwork stuff by the end of today, like you've lost the house and we're going to take it from you. And they were pressuring us to do risky things with money and all that kind of stuff. And, but we held on to the truth of saying, God, we surrender it to you. We would love this house. This is really what we want. We feel like you're in it. We felt like it's the right place for us. But if it's not, we don't want it. And if it means we don't know where we're going to live after we get married, then that's fine um, because we know that it's your will that we're after. Um, you've got the plan. Your thoughts are better than our thoughts. So take it away from us if it's not the right thing. And that was painful and hard to pray that. And, and me and my wife really struggled in terms of going through that. There'd be moments when she'd be like, no, but I really want it. I don't want to pray that for God to take it away from me and then, and then it would flip around and it'd be the way around. And, but it's important to surrender these things and to say, God, your will. And, and in the end, he honored it. And actually, there were so many things that the housing developer asked of us and we never did any of it because we surrendered it to God and, and we ended up in the house after all um, because it was his will. Um, and so he, he, it's his timing and not our timing as well. We, we can... God, can, God will always answer our prayers, but not necessarily in, this, in the way or the timing that we would expect. Um, and so he does speak to us, even if he's saying, I'll reveal it to you soon. And so we, we need to hold on to his timing, hold on to knowing, God, when it, whenever you're going to move and make this thing shift and happen, then I trust and believe that it's your will, and I'm not going to strive to make it happen in my own strength or power, because if I do that, then I know it's not going to be right, because it's, it's going to be built on sand, and it's not going to be built on rock. Hebrews 12, 13 says, Fix our eyes on Jesus. Consider him who endured such opposition so that you will not grow weary or lose heart. And, and that's what we see here, Jesus enduring and going through the difficulty of waiting and knowing what's to come. That he, he endured the most painful crucifixion and death ever. And and came through it, and we have that power living in us. So that's the encouragement that we read in the scripture to fix our eyes on Jesus because he's been through so much worse than we could ever face ourselves against. And we've got the power of him living in, in us to keep us going, to help us to endure through it. And lastly, just in terms of his, his will, um, in, in those moments of on hold, it can, it can be really hard to comfort ourselves, I think, in terms of knowing we're, we're upset and we're hurt and what does that look like? Well, an encouragement to seek his comfort. Seek his comfort, not, not our own. And God has to be our place of comfort when we're on hold and facing struggles. And that means 
following his will of bringing it all to him, laying it all down to him. Doesn't mean turning to eating shed loads of ice cream. Doesn't mean turning to hours and hours of box sets or, or looking at porn or overspending money on shopping and clothes that we don't have. All of those earthly comforts that we can all fall into and I, I'm just as guilty, if not more guilty, than the next person of doing that. But, so I'm reminding myself as much as you guys, we've got to hold on to his comfort in the struggles. Got to hold on to his comfort because he's got it. It's in his hands. So when life puts you on hold, hold on to God. Hold on to truth. Hold on to honesty. And hold on to his will. And basically all of that is just about like power, like seeking the power of heaven in our situations. Seeking the power of heaven into ourselves in that transformation stuff we've been talking about and into our situation, speaking the miracle working power of God over that thing that's on hold. I think that's enough for me. Maybe we'll create some space for God to come and speak to us and maybe take some of us off, off hold, maybe re- give some of us some new energy to keep holding on. So should we stand and we'll, and we'll pray and see what God wants to do? Just gonna, I'm just going to give a moment. I've, I've got some uh, prayerful thoughts on some of the things that God might be speaking to us about that will, will seem quite obvious. So um, I'm just going to give us a moment for the Holy Spirit to come and speak to us all in an individual way. He knows what your on-hold moment is. He knows what your struggles are. And he knows what, what the takeaway from this message is for you. So we, we're just going to give a moment for him to come and speak. So come, Holy Spirit. You might want to open your hands as a sign of wanting to receive from him. Come and speak to us, God. Come and reveal to us what what you want us to do with this. What, what are the on hold moments? What what do we need to hold on to in a new way? As I, as I was praying, I got, I got a sense that there's some people in the room tonight that almost forgot that you were on hold. There were, there were some things that you've been wanting God to do, and you've been waiting for so long that you almost forgot that you were on hold, and, and, and you forgot, you stopped thinking about it, you stopped praying about it. There's some dreams and desires that you had that you've just let go because you were waiting for so long. And, and God wants to bring some of that stuff to the surface again and, and give you a new energy to, to keep going, to, to persevere again. I felt like there were some people here that have just not been inviting God in. There's a, a real pain that you just couldn't, you couldn't bring it to him. And there, was, there was maybe something around... Uh, shame in that about not bringing something particularly if it's some some brokenness or something within you I've been in that place before where I, I didn't even want to bring it to God and say I need you to help me because I was so ashamed of what it was that I didn't even want to speak it out to him but but until we bring it to him and then speak his truth into it we're not going to see freedom so this is a safe place to do that 
know, maybe some of you are you're overwhelmed with the lies. You're going to be on hold for 92 minutes. You're 36 in the queue. You're not good enough. You're not strong enough. You're not going to see breakthrough. Oh, we want to speak truth over that. We want, to, we want God to break those lies and speak truth over it. Some of you have lost your endurance. You feel like you've just run out of energy. You just can't go anymore. And lastly, there might, there might be some that just, just know that as I was speaking about surrender, you just got a bit of a feeling in your stomach and thought, oh gosh, I've been, I've been holding on to what I want this to look like a bit too much and I need to completely give it over to God. And so what we do now, particularly for those of you, if you're new, we, we just create space at the front here for you to come and do some business with God, to come and be prayed for. So if you want to respond to any of those things or, or anything else, then I'm just going to invite people to come forward now and people from the family are just going to come and pray with you and they'll, they'll speak God's truth over, over your on-hold moment or whatever it is. That's great. Let's keep keep coming guys if we could have some um, church family members to come and pray that would be great God's here his Holy Spirit's moving among us and those of you in your seats, you can you can keep engaging if you don't feel like you want to come forward. You could pray with the person next to you or you could just wait a, a moment on God and see what he's got to say to you. We could do with a few more people to pray if that's all right. Some guys and girls, please. If you're, if you're part of this family and you, you love Jesus, we'd love you to come and pray. few more ladies to pray if that's all right please if, if you're waiting for prayer um, just just wait on God and we'll get someone to you don't worry we've got plenty of time we could do with some more women to pray if anyone feels able. to do with some gents to pray. There's, there's quite a few people come forward that would l love God to meet with them and it'd be amazing if we could have some church family members to come and stand alongside them. Some, we need men and women if, if possible. Trinity Youth, I don't want you to feel excluded from this. If you feel able to come and pray for someone, that'd be awesome. We'd love that. You don't need to be an adult. You can come and pray too. Holy Spirit, come and do what only you can do.